Time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill my gracious promise with the people of Israel and Judah. In those days and at that time, I will raise up a righteous branch from David's line, who will do what is just and right in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. And this is what he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. The season of Advent is an invitation to meditate on the promises of God. Here is what the prophet Jeremiah wants us to see. Number one, God will send a righteous leader to come forth to lead God's people. Number two, the one who comes will carry out God's justice and God's righteousness. And finally, the one who rises up will bring salvation and safety for all people. The prophet challenges us to believe that God's promises will still be fulfilled. The prophet challenges us in this Advent season to lift up our souls to God and look for God's handiwork, to be people walking a path of life with love and faithfulness, 
of working in our lives and communities of faith for justice and righteousness, and living as a light of hope to those around us. If we remain alert to the promises of the Lord and live as a light of hope, we will truly be blessed as we wait for the Christ child to once again come into our lives and into our world. I invite you to respond as we prepare to light the first Advent candle. The days are coming, says the Lord, when I will fulfill the promises I have made. To you, O Lord, we lift up our souls, and you, O God, we trust. The one who is coming will show us the paths of steadfast love and faithfulness. Teach us your ways, O God, of our salvation. We light this first candle in the sure hope that God's promises endures. We will live in the light of hope as we wait the coming of the Lord. star. Yay! Come to the drive through Advent Festival today in just a few hours from 3 to 5. We're going to have lots of opportunities for you to listen to music with the choir. We're going to have a takeaway of an Advent little gift bag for you all, a children's giveaway, and the United Methodist Women will be selling pecans pieces. A bag of pieces will be $10 and a bag of pecan halves will be $11. So you can bring your money, pay and take it away with you right there. And make your pie. And make your pie. We also have a missions opportunity. Um, you may sponsor a child from the Stanton Center by picking up their holiday shopping gift list or by donating $25 on the spot. If you take the list away, we just need you to bring the gifts back here to church by December 16th. We hope to see you there. Be there or be square. Hello everyone and welcome to News to Know. Julie and I are excited to share with you an opportunity that we will have here on the campus of Calvary during the Advent season. During the season of Advent, we would like to give you an opportunity to come to the campus 
and have a time of reflection, have a time of prayer, and even have some guided meditations and scripture readings for you. So please join us every week for this season on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. On Tuesdays, we'll be here from 11 to 1, Wednesdays from 4 to 6, and Fridays between 10 and noon. We welcome you to slip into the Child's Chapel here for a guided meditation and scripture readings, or just to sit and pray and think and be alone with God, um, and to light a candle if you wish. So we hope to see you beginning this week, this week of Advent. We hope to see you here. Have a blessed Advent, everyone. Good morning and welcome to today's children's moment on the first Sunday of Advent. So I was going to talk today about the manger and... Well, hi, Miss Mills. Hi, Pastor. How are you? I'm fine. I want to hear your story about the manger. Good. I was just going to get ready to talk about the manger and the birth of Jesus and who was actually there and when they came. So that's what I was getting ready to do. So who are all the people that showed up at the manger? Well, the animals were there from the very beginning. And then Mary and Joseph made their journey and the wise men and there were shepherds that came and the angels were watching over Joseph and Mary while they were making their journey to Bethlehem. You know, I often see Miss Mills, all these people gathered together in, in a manger or nativity or a stable. Did they all arrive all at one time? They did not. The animals were probably the only ones that were there from the very beginning. Mary and Joseph, like I said, were making their journey with the angels watching them from Nazareth to Bethlehem. The wise men were coming from far away in the east, and the shepherds, most likely, were still out in the fields tending to all of their sheep. So, you know, you just said about journey and traveling, and I got thinking about an idea. You know, we're in a strange time. We're not traveling as much as we used to. Families right. that normally got together uh, all the time aren't doing that. We want to be careful and safe about that. So I was wondering, do you think that we could actually have people take the different pieces of the nativity and travel them through their house? Like uh, you said, the wise men came from the east. Right. So maybe they could start in a room that's on the east side oh, of the house. I love that idea. That way we're all making the journey to the manger at the same time. I love it. So the shepherds could be someplace else. Right. And then who else? Mary and Joseph. Mary and Joseph. And the three wise men. And if you have some angels, the angels were just kind of always over Mary and Joseph until they got to the manger. We all need angels. Amen. So, so they could begin like in one advent, right. one place, and then they could move another advent, right. another, and get closer and closer. Kind of like the four weeks in advent. A wonderful idea. So that they could get closer and closer, and then uh, if they're all there on the fourth Sunday of Advent, let's say, then, then when does Jesus arrive? A tradition in my house was that the children always put baby Jesus into the manger scene or the crush scene on Christmas Eve night or Christmas morning. So baby Jesus and Mary and Joseph would be there on Christmas. And even then, the shepherds and the wise men came a little after that. So one of the things that you're celebrating is, of course, a nativity, uh, a crash, as you say, a symbol of all the people involved in the birth of Jesus. Right. And we could travel through our houses yeah. and celebrate that on Christmas Eve, everybody gathers For the at birth. the manger. Yeah, that's a, a great, great idea. idea. Good. I like it. Let's do that. Why, okay. don't, why don't you uh, close this time with our family with a prayer? All right. Dear God, as we light this first Advent candle of hope, help us all journey to the manger where we will see the birth of the baby that was sent to save the world. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So you will see that our altar table, wonderfully decorated with beautiful plants and candles, is missing something. You know what it's missing? It's missing our nativity pieces. Just like we've asked the children at home to take a trip 
throughout their house with the members of the Nativity, we're going to do the same thing here at Calvary Church. The shepherds and the wise men and the angels and Mary and Joseph are going to take a trip through the next four weeks of Advent, moving throughout the church, finally coming to our altar to assemble at our manger scene. Travel with us at home and here at church. Open our hearts and minds to these words of Holy Scripture. Use them to renew our hope. Use them to change our lives. Then use us to renew hope in our world. Amen. Our lessons coming from Isaiah 64's chapter, verses 1 through 9. Oh, that you tear open the heavens and come down, so that the mountains would quake at your presence. As when fire kindles brushwoods, and the fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries, so that the nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome deeds that we did not expect, you came down, the mountain quaked at your presence. From ages past, no one has heard. No ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God beside you, who works for those who wait for Him. You meet those who gladly do right, those who remember you in your ways. But you are angry, and we sinned, because you hid yourself, we transgressed. We have all become like one who is unclean and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy cloth. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. There is no one who calls on your name or attempts to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have delivered us into the hand of our iniquity. Yet, O oh Lord, you are our father, we are the clay, and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be exceedingly angry, O Lord, and do not remember iniquity forever. Now consider, we are all your people. Today, I am privileged to introduce to you Reverend Tony Love, as our guest preacher on this first Sunday of Advent. Reverend Love currently, as a member of the Baltimore Washington Conference of the United Methodist Church, serves as the assistant to our bishop. We're delighted for Reverend Love to share with us in this meditation today as he brings to us the power and the purpose of the gift of hope on this first Sunday of Advent. To the family and friends of God, to my brothers and sisters in faith, greetings of grace and peace to you. Isn't it good news to know that God's grace and peace are still ours today? I rejoice this day that our God has blessed us with another day of life. We woke up in time and not in eternity to see the dawning of another day a day filled with God's provision of new mercies that prove to us God is faithful. As we come to this celebration of praise and worship, I trust that you, like me, are coming with a grateful heart, full of thanksgiving, and with deep appreciation for all that God has done, is doing, and will do. Today, God's beloved, we are starting our Advent journey, the season of expectant waiting and preparation that calls people of faith to remember as well as rejoice over the Christ child that has come and the conquering Christ who is to come. 
When we entered this celebration, our journey today, we lit the first candle of our Advent wreath, the candle of hope. Let me share with you a story. It's a joke, but I believe it is food for thought as we consider hope. Will you listen? There were twins about the age of five or six. Worried that the two had developed extreme personalities, one being a total pessimist and the other a total optimist, their parents took them to a psychiatrist. First, the psychiatrist treated the pessimist. Trying to brighten his outlook, the psychiatrist took him to a room piled to the ceiling high with brand new toys. Instead of yelling with delight, the little fellow burst into tears. What's the matter, the psychiatrist asked, baffled. Don't you want to play with any of these toys? Yes, the little boy bawled. But if I did, I'd only break them. Next, the psychiatrist treated the optimist. Trying to dampen his outlook, the psychiatrist took him into a room piled high to the ceiling with horse manure. But instead of wrinkling his nose in disgust, the optimist admitted just the yell of delight the psychiatrist had been hoping to hear from his brother, the pessimist. Then he clambered to the top of the pile, dropped to his knees, and began gleefully digging out scoop after scoop with his bare hands. What do you think you're doing? The psychiatrist asked, just as baffled by the optimist as he had been by the pessimist. With all this manure, the little boy replied, beaming, there must be a pony in here somewhere. Hope. Isn't it interesting, if not amazing, how one acts when hope is present? Will you join me in prayer? Let us pray. Consecrate me now to thy service, Lord, and by the power of grace divine. Let my soul look up with a steadfast hope. Let my will be lost in thine. Draw me nearer. Draw us nearer. In the name of Jesus, the guarantor of all my prayers, I ask. Hallelujah and amen. People of God, hope is defined simply as a wish an optimistic state of mind that is based upon the expectation of positive outcomes with respect to events or circumstances in one's life or the world at large. The belief that things will work, especially when it seems otherwise. In the Bible, hope is defined as the confident expectation of what God has promised and its strength is in God's faithfulness. The people, the people of the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, God promised a savior, and those people waited with confidence for God's promise to be fulfilled. At the appointed time, God sent a savior. God sent his son, Jesus, born of Mary. God, a faithful God, intersected with humanity. God in Jesus of Nazareth becomes divinely human as well as humanly divine. God robes in flesh and comes to be with God's created. A savior, a redeemer was hoped for. The coming of Jesus was God's promise being fulfilled. Jesus was their hope. Jesus is our hope too. When I think of Jesus as hope, I become acutely aware that hope is not a posture of resignation, nor reclining into a kumbaya moment of marking time. No, instead, hope is an active, living, 
if not lively stance that beckons me and beckons you, it beckons us to engage, to be and do as hope did, as Jesus did. I recall hope was not born into the best of places, under the best of circumstances. No, hope arrived during a governmental occupation in a city so overrun because of the census taking that hope's birthplace was not great or grand, but very humble, lowly, meek. Hope arrived in the filth and the foul smells of a manger and probably unattended. Even though the heavens declared the arrival of hope as hope made its entry into the world, wickedness in high places sought to destroy hope's promise and potential. Because of this threat, hope becomes an immigrant who flees from his homeland of Judea only to resettle in another place, Egypt. Hope, hope born into a blended family, had a stepdad that took hope as his own and raised hope. And despite hope's birth and its challenges, hope kept digging and hope rose. When hope, when hope saw the suffering the injury and harm of people. Hope stopped to talk with, to engage, reached out to touch, make a connection, and then sought to bring healing, restoration, and wholeness because hope always desired to bring people to a better place, state, or reality. Hope reached out to those who were on the edges, on the very margins of their society and their community. When hope, met a woman from Samaria at the well of Jacob, one with whom Holmes hope should have never associated with because of race relations, her questionable background. Hope took time to encounter her because hope did not see her for who she was, but for who she could become. Encountering a man who was mentally ill, living among the dead in a cemetery, a man whose community had tried to subdue him with chains, to contain him, a man who had cut himself with stones and rocks he found. Hope attended to him, called out the challenges that afflicted him so that deliverance and relief could come. Oh, see, family and friends, hope does not discard, discount, or disregard. As hope, hope told parables, teaching stories, it became apparent and clear that the way we've always done it was up for reconsideration as hope taught us that a prodigal son could go home and be celebrated. A good shepherd would leave the 99 and go in search of the one. Who your neighbor is has nothing to do with the expectations associated with position or status but everything to do with compassionate actions. And in God's economy, the first would be last and the last would be first. Hope, hope wrecked many things. Hope reconstructed a withered hand. Hope commanded a paralytic to rise from his mat. Hope told the winds and the waves, peace be still. Hope turned over the tables in the place of worship in protest. Hope called dead things back to life. When hope was set up, falsely accused, sentenced to die, hope carried the weight for others. He's not heavy. She's not heavy. They're my family. Hope was mocked, beaten, spat upon, hung up for our hangups, pierced, died, and yet sprang up eternal to offer a more abundant way of living. Oh, my sisters and my brothers, as people of hope, followers of Jesus, who is our hope, hope calls us to be active participants in God's purpose and plan, in God's will and God's way, fully understanding that God's thoughts are not our thoughts, neither our ways God ways. Can we, can we be people of hope? who pray the Lord's prayer, make the claim thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
and then sit along the sidelines of life to witness the advancement of darkness, knowing that there are the haves and the have-nots. Hope, hope compels us to participate, to usher in God's kingdom and God's will, to assist God's reign being made real here and now as in heaven. Can we be people of hope who trust that the Spirit of the Lord is upon us because the Spirit has anointed us to proclaim good news to the poor, sends us to proclaim freedom to the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, then watch our siblings in faith and of this world being held hostage by power, greed, or privilege? Can we be people of hope who affirm the prophet of old Micah's words that the Lord requires us to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God, and then turn our backs as we witness persons being treated unfairly and being discriminated against? Can we be people of hope who espouse the belief that we have been called, we have been set apart, and then in the face of needing to feed the hungry, give drink to the thirsty, invite the stranger in, clothe the needy, and visit the sick and imprisoned, deny ever seeing these as servant opportunities? Beloved, beloved of God, during this Advent journey, let us consider, let us consider where hope is requiring us to be present and accounted for, to show up, to show out, to set it off in the name of Jesus, who is our hope. Consider, during this global pandemic, since mid-March, hope has taught us how to pivot, how to be the church that is not a building, but a fellowship of faithful believers, who move mission and ministry to online presence, discovered ways to enlarge our footprint so that serving and blessing and reaching and caring and teaching and encouraging folks did not skip a beat as we advance God's ways. Hope, hope demands that we keep on digging. Saints, there's a pony in here. Keep on fighting. Might will yield to right. Keep on marching for those who can't take another step. Change will come. Keep on giving, pouring yourselves out for others until all people have a fair share. Keep on speaking up, turning the tide towards realizing God's beloved community. Keep on serving, for there's plenty room at the table. Keep on loving. In the end, love prevails. Keep hope. Keep it alive. Keep it well. Amen. With thanksgiving and with hope, 
as we enter this new year, beginning with Advent, let us pray. Almighty and most gracious God, we give you thanks for the gift of hope. As we begin this new year, remembering all the events that are going to take place in the life of the faith community, we give you thanks for the gift of Advent that leads to Christmas. We give you thanks for the birth of Christ and then the teachings of Christ that take place in the season of Epiphany. And we move from Epiphany into Lent, Lent into Easter, and Easter into Pentecost, the birth and growth and spread of the gospel. So be with us in this first Sunday of a new liturgical year as we remember and remind ourselves of your gifts to us throughout our lives and in this world. We pray on this first Sunday of Advent also for the days that just happened in our Thanksgiving celebration. It was different this year, O oh Lord. Those large family gatherings didn't take place. People that are normally at the dinner table with us feasting on wonderful bounty were no longer there because of illness or distance or the uncertainty of this coronavirus. We give you thanks, however, that Zoom and other experiences of technology have allowed us to stay connected to one another. And for the gift of connectedness, we give you thanks. O oh Lord, be with our leaders throughout this country and throughout this world as they continue to fight the virus that affects so many of our friends and our families. Give us courage in this time of fatigue and uncertainty. Give us hope that we know that a new tomorrow is just around the corner. Give us sustaining love for one another as we wear the mask that protects others as it protects us. Most gracious God, be with us in these winter months that are approached in Christmas time and December and into January and February. Let us be ever mindful that health, good health, strong health is a desire for all of us and for each other. Gracious God, turn our hearts to your child to come. Turn our lives to his message of peace. Turn our hearts and our lives, our very minds, our very strength, all aspects of our lives that we might humble ourselves and join the billions, the billions of people that will in celebration kneel at the manger in Bethlehem. Bless us, sustain us, encourage us, and grant us peace. For we ask this in all prayers in the hope of Christ, who invites us with one voice to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
You know, friends, our service today is over, but our life here in this beginning Advent season continues. May God bless you wherever you are, wherever you go, whatever you're doing, may God bless you and sustain you, keep you safe, keep you strong. And may the presence and power of God, Almighty Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with us all and grant us peace. Amen.